All right. Um, so I'd like to get started. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, uh, for coming today to our wonderful talk. Um, today, we are lucky to host uh, Pedro Amaral, who is a uh, professor at the Department of Economics and Center for Regional Development and Planning at the University, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, Brazil, as well as a fellow at the uh, Center for Spatial Data Science at the University of Chicago. Um, Pedro has a large collection of uh, research across spatial econometrics, statistical methods, development, and planning. Uh, and today we'll be talking a little bit about doing uh, a variety of spatial econometric methods, uh, sort of a conceptual overview and some code uh, in the Python programming language. Um, I'd like to remind all of you that uh, during the talk, your feedback and comments are incredibly welcome. If you uh, go down to the bottom of the Zoom call, there is a Q&A functionality. If you ask questions in that Q&A, we can answer them as the talk goes along, as well as if you post questions in the chat, we'll address them as we can. So please make sure that you submit your questions as the talk rolls through, that way that they're in the open and, and uh, people can see them during the talk. So thanks very much. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Pedro to start his talk. Thank you so much, Levi. Thank you so much, Rachel, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to take part in this seminar series. Uh, if you have been lucky as I have to attend the previous sessions, you know how the bar is raised really high. So I'll try to do my best here to get at least close to it, but I'm very glad to be part of this. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me start sharing my screen. So today I'm going to talk about spatial regression and regimes using Python. Uh, as Levi said, I'm going to just do a brief introduction and then I'll jump to spatial regression and spatial regimes. Uh, then Levi, I'll be glad to have Levi join, jumping in to the presentation and taking the stage to talk about multi-scale geographically weighted, sorry for the typo there, weighted regression. And finally, I'll speak a bit about clusters uh, regression as well. So this is the outline of what we're going to see today. So as a brief introduction, I mean, everything that happens, of course, happens in space and time. So uh, all the data that we have, all the events that we have, they have a time and a space coordinate. And sometimes we forget about these things and we just ignore these coordinates. Thinking specifically about the spatial tag of all the events that we have in the world, I mean, space is not neutral. There are spatial effects. So since everything that everything happens in space and space is not a neutral, a neutral attribute, so, uh, and this is not the exception, this is rather the norm. So everything uh, is, can be subject to externalities, interactions, spillovers, contagion, I mean, you name it. There are many spatial effects out there. And since all the interactions, all the events, they do happen at some place, of course, they are subject to this context. So we need to take these issues into consideration. And sometimes uh, in sociological or econom economical or, I mean, whatever field, research field you work on, but most of the theories, sometimes they do forget about this. And space is, is relegated to uh, just a marginal issue. And in fact, it may be uh, one of the most important aspects to explain heterogeneity that we have in data. So space and its effects, as I've said, of course, they are not uniform. I mean, there are hierarchies, uh, there are leading and lagging regions. Uh, we have uh, specialization and diversification. We have segregation. There are many issues that may impact how space and spatial effects may uh, affect the events that we see and the data that we have. So these effects, they do need to be taken into account. Uh, a specific type of effect that we have when we're talking about space is the neighborhood effect. If we think about space as a region in terms of something that is constrained in space, in a concrete, in a geographical space, not in an abstract space, 
this space is usually a product of social interaction or a product of social uh, there is a production of social space so space is produced by people and their interactions and their behavior and people and space they are endogenously determinant in a sense that their behavior the behavior of the people is what shapes a neighborhood or shapes a space and being part of a neighborhood and being part of a specific space also shapes the behavior of different people as well. So we do have this endogeneity, oops, sorry. Uh, sorry, I just clicked. We do have this endogeneity between uh, people and space as uh, a simultaneous determination. So, and not only that, I mean, people, uh, space is produced by, by social processes, but these also change in time. So of course we know that human behavior is not the same over time. We change, like depending on, on the shocks that we face or just the, the, the life, our life uh, cycle, we change our behavior and people do change their behaviors all the time. And if we think about space as a product of social behavior, we have that space is also changing over time constantly. So there is a dynam uh, some dynamics to neighborhood and to this constrained uh, space in that sense. So the regional pattern is constantly changing. And therefore, we need again to try to take into account these ever, uh, this ever change uh, space. Okay, so now I'm just going to show how I'll try to, or we try to tackle these in the context of spatial regression and regimes. So as I said, I mean, data, all data has a, space, a spatial and, and time tag, even though sometimes we're not aware of those tags. I mean, everything happened in space and time. And if we think about data as observations that are ordered in space and time, we can try to uh, think about this issue in a more specific way. Space is usually, when we think about data, is usually an arbitrary space. So we usually have some administrative boundaries or we have uh, some uh, uh, exogenous determinate, uh, determinate region or something like that, that um, of course, I mean, is subject to issues like aggregation, like zoning, like scale. So if we think about data in that sense, that there are there is this uh, differentiation uh, about uh, these aspects of the spatial nature of the data, of course, the relationship between agents or people or whatever, or, or firms or whatever we think about in space, it's going to subject of change as well. So it's going to be subject to these, these decision or these data uh, aspects. Uh, and spatial processes are the same. I mean, they also change uh, uh, depending on what we're thinking about. So we have flows, we have patterns, we have structures, we have interactions that are not the same and that change uh, depending on the area we are thinking about. So the conclusion here is that there is lack of structural stability over space. Space is not homogeneous. The relationships across the spaces are not homogeneous. So it is uh, some very strong assumption when we take these as something that is constant or stable or homogeneous uh, across the areas. So everything is, uh, is different uh, depending on the scale, the, the areas and the zoning that we're thinking about. So, I mean, it's, it's really hard to think about these issues as constant. Okay, so uh, if we go even more specific, uh, deep in, into spatial regression, we usually try to classify these issues as spatial dependence and heterogeneity. So spatial dependence will be more related to the interaction that we have between the observations. So there is a correlation in their behavior or in the way the data uh, is shown up or some, there is some non-observable aspect that is, works at a different sp spatial scale or uh, affects the space uh, differently. And then we do have that the data is spatially correlated. Or we may have just some heterogeneity, uh, meaning that some areas may behave differently. These in, uh, issues impose some challenges for us. Of course, uh, space is multidirectional in the sense that if one area may affect the other, that area may also be affected by this other region. So differently than time, where usually we have that just the past affects the future, in space, we have these uh, multidirectional uh, effects going on. So the space, uh, the spaces affect each; they have to affect each other. 
in that sense, I mean, we may want to be as specific about a space as possible. However, if we're thinking about modeling, we do need to uh, take into consideration model uh, identification. So our model must, we must be able to identify the parameters in our models. So we have this trade-off. I mean, we have to balance these things out. We want to be as specific as possible about space because of its heterogeneity, but we also need to be somewhat more general because we need to have enough data for each area so uh, that we're able to identify uh, the model that all the parameters in the model that we want to, to take into consideration. So this, is, this illustration is just to, to show us that, that for example, here we clearly have two regimes going on. Uh, and if we think about them as something that is homogeneous, or if we think about it as some data that has some structural stability, we may think about it as a negative correlation between Y and X. But if we are able to separate the individuals and classify them into two different groups, then we may be uh, able to identify the difference that we have uh, in the relationship between these variables, and it may actually be quite different. Okay, so now let me bring in the Python part of this talk. So the tools that I'm going to show you uh, on how we are able to tackle these things, these tools are provided by PySAL. Uh, so PySAL is a Python-based library for spatial analysis. It's a meta package in the sense that it's built up uh, by different smaller packages now. I mean, it was refactored recently, but this is how the structure works uh, now. It is an open source project that was designed to support spatial data science. So we have many different tools in, Py in PySAL. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, it was founded in, 20, in 2005 by Serge Ray and Luke Anseling, and it was first released in 2010. So there are two links there. If you want to know a bit more about PySAL, uh, you can just follow these links. I'll show them uh, later again. So as I said, there are many packages within PySAL. So there are some packages that we deal with spatial weights or the neighboring, uh, how we define uh, the neighboring region for each of our observations, how we deal with input output and file uh, readings, how uh, we, where we show our example data sets. I mean, so this is the core PySAL. We have some uh, PySAL packages that deal with exploratory spatial data analysis. So there are six packages there that will be specific for that. We have, I'll ju jump to the last, we have uh, a family of packages that deal with visualization or geo-visualization. -visual and what I'm going to talk about today or I'm talking about today is modeling, right? So we have uh, a family of packages uh, that deal with spatial statistical models. Among these, I'm going to talk to you more specifically about multi-scale geographically weighted regression. And I'll be glad to have Levi jumping in for this. And SPREG, uh, the spatial regression and econometrics package within PySAL. So I'll start with SPREG. In SPREG, we are thinking about econometric models uh, in the sense that the idea, of, the way we think about space in these models is that first you need to have a theory of something that, I mean, you think uh, you want to, to research about. And the theory should be able to show you how is how does this spatial process work in, in, uh, in a structural way? So from the theory, you should be able not only to know what are the important variables that you have in this process that you want to study, but also how is the spatial nature of this, this process? Because then you're going to think about the structure of how a way to structure this theory in a sense of what variables are important, how they relate to each other, or at least what hypothesis do you have on how they relate to each other, and how you think you may be able to answer important questions about this theory and contribute to it. A next step would be how to actually model this. So when you think about uh, a model, you have to think about the specification of this model. So how do, uh, what would be your dependent variable? What is the main variable that you want to uh, explore? How do uh, the other variables, the independent variables, or not independent, but at least explanatory, explanatory variables, 
how do they relate to this main variable, to this dependent variable? So how can you construct this relationship or put some structure into it in a model that is feasible, that you can observe the data, or at least if you cannot observe it, you can at least use that structure in a model uh, context to be able to model the unobservable. And then after you are able to run your model, of course, uh, the final stage would be to analyze the results that you have from this. So SPREG is going to help you through this, uh, through this path. There are some other ways to think about this that, are, that have less structure. So you may think about some models that are non-parametric or uh, that you actually have a more uh, relaxed structure to it. So SPREG will not help you with these uh, this way of thinking about spatial process. So the idea here is that you need to have to be able to put a structure into your data and think about the relationships in that sense. Okay, so let's deep in, uh, go deep in econometrics more specifically. So we have a dependent variable Y. We have a set of explanatory variables that, as I said, may be independent or not. They may be uh, endogenous variables as well. But anyway, so we have a set of explanatory variables x. We have a set of parameters that we do not know and we want to estimate betas. And we have an uh, error term as well. The idea of spatial econometrics is that we this is a restricted model in the sense that it's not taking into account in space at all. So what when we think about spatial econometrics, we think about relaxing some hypotheses of this model and uh, adding some spatial to it, some spatial aspect to it. This spatial aspect may be uh, either in terms of a lag, a spatial lag, in the sense that you'll have some simultaneous effects going on between the regions. So one region interacts with others and then you have that uh, the variable, the level of the variable in a given region or changing the variable in a given region will affect other regions. Or we may have that as part of the error term in the sense that it's some, we have some spatial dependence that uh, we do not observe and we just want to model that correlation that we have in the error term. And uh, that is something that uh, ordinarily squares or some other types of classic econometric, classic econometric models cannot deal with. So this is the idea. So when we think about spatial econometrics, we're just trying to add space into the framework or into the structure of any given model. So I'm going to focus on some specific uh, methods here, but SPREG offers plenty of them. I'll show to you a list uh, in the next slide, but I just want to uh, advertise before I go ahead, this book from Luke Anseling and Sergio Ray, where they will show you most of the methods that we have in SPREG. The book is from 2014. Sorry if I don't get the date right, but something around there. So I'm, uh, it doesn't show everything that is available from SPREG because the package has evolved from them. But the basics or most of the stuff are shown uh, in the book. Okay, so a list of what we have. So uh, in SPREG, you will have spatial regression models. Uh, they can be estimated either by maximum likelihood or methods of moments or, or OLS, two stage least squares. You can do spatial legs, you can do spatial errors, you can do both. Uh, you can do uh, SLX. I mean, there are many, plenty uh, models that you can run. Uh, you can do regime models. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Or you can do cluster, you will be able to do cluster regressions on our next release. You can already do seemingly and related regressions. So you can do uh, time regressions if you want to think about uh, these equations in a sort of framework being uh, for different time. More specific spatial panels, you will be able to run from SPREG again from our next release onwards. So it's something staged to be published in our next release. And you can do a bunch of spatial diagnostics uh, in the regression. So how can you do it? I mean, if you install SPREG and from PySAL's website and SPREG's website, it's very easy for you to find a tutorial on how to do the installation. But once you install SPREG, all you have to do is load your shape file or your data. It doesn't really need to be a shape file. If you have some coordinates, you can uh, just load a DBF or whatever type of data that you have. Uh, but here in this example, I'm just showing to you how to just load a shape file. From this shape file, you can create a weights matrix to say which observations are neighbors to each other. 
And then, I mean, you choose your Y, you choose your axis, and boom, you have a GM lag model, and the results are really fast. And, and it scales up pretty well, especially the, the, the GMM methods, they scale up pretty well to the number of observations. And I mean, we've tested it many times with uh, 100, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of observations, and, and it happens instantaneously. So, I mean, it, it's very neat to run these. Now, more specifically about regimes. Uh, so, if you have regimes, it means that the not only space may be part of your model, but the betas may not be homogeneous in your model. So, as I said, I mean, space may, their, their structure, this, yeah, there may be not a, a, a structural stability in your model. So, different unities, they, have, uh, they may have a different relationship between your x's and your y's. And if you think that's the case, or you just want to test if that's the case, you can just run a spatial regimes method. So here we have only two regimes. Of course, we could have as many regimes as possible given our data size. So the model would still be, we would still be able to identify the parameters. But the idea is that you're able to model spatial heterogeneity this way. So uh, if you think about the Columbus, Ohio here, you may have a different relationship between south and north uh, portions of, uh, of the data. And then you may want to see if that is really different or not. So how do you do that? I mean, it's again, it's the same, it's a simple command. Uh, you can just do GM lag regimes uh, on your Y and your axis and set up what is the variable that selects or that assigns the regimes. And you'll be able to test uh, using, again, a spatial lag model, but could be error or whatever. You will have different, a different set of coefficients for each of these regimes. And uh, in the end of the results, you get a, ch a child test. And the good thing about this child test is that it's going to show you whether or not you actually had different regimes. So it is going to test for you if the betas are uh, really different or if they are not, if, if you, it was just hypothesis that cannot be verified with your data. So in this case, for example, we see that no, the betas between North and Southern uh, Columbus, they are not different. They are statistically the same. Uh, you probably realized from that result that I was considering only a single spatial lag parameter, but even that you may want to change. Even that may be different uh, across the regimes that you have or the observations. And if that's the case, you can run a regime regression separately for each of the, these regimes. So you may have a separate lag for each of these regimes. And then in the end, also get the tests on whether the coefficients are, are stable or not across this structure. So to sum up spatial regimes, uh, what we have is that spatial regimes in PySAL, they can be applied to all standard and non-standard non-spatial uh, spatial and non-spatial models. And we have a number, the number of the regimes may impose some uh, challenges for you in the sense that uh, from the previous slide, uh, I forgot to show you, but for example, the way Columbus was divided resulted in an island and in spatial phenometrics, we really don't want to have islands uh, for the regression. So it is a problem that we would have to take care of. So whenever we think about the regimes and the number of regimes, these are issues that we may need to face and we will have to deal with them. But again, I mean, just two sets of betas may not be enough still, you may want more. And if that's the case, Geographically weighted regressions may be best suit for you. And so I'll pass the stage to Levi to, to work on these. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So um, oh, uh, Sorry. It, it looks like there might be an issue I here. I think the beta the, has uh, disappeared. Uh, I had another version. Maybe while we're speaking, trying this, I'll try to learn sure. the other version. Okay. Where I fixed this. Sorry. No worries. Sorry about that. Um, so as Pedro has been talking about in uh, regimes regression, we're usually interested in cases where the effect of a given uh, variable on our outcome will be different in two different places. And in the standard linear model, we just have one effect for all places. So that's kind of like a big global average um, that uh, relates some variable x to the outcome y. The main concept inside of geographically weighted regression is that your individual effect estimate can change at every single location. Geographically weighted regression is a data borrowing technique that allows you to try and get individual estimates 
at specific locations, at every single location in your sample. And geographically re weighted regression comes up because we don't always know where regions stop and start. It can be um, conceptually appropriate for regions to exist at a specific location um, or at a, a you know an individual administrative district boundary. However, it's not always appropriate um, to assume that that boundary applies strictly. So when regions are endogenous, in the sense that we don't know where one beta starts, starts and another beta stops, um, it's necessary then uh, for us to use other techniques. Mm -hmm. And geographically weighted regression is one such technique. Uh, so thank you. Um, so geographically weighted regression works by um, constructing an estimate in a standard linear model, but only considering the data that's close to each site in your sample. So here, I think uh, the, the minus sign is supposed to stand in for a, uh, a beta. And basically, what's distinctive about a geographically weighted regression is that you get distinct beta or distinct slope estimates at every site. So as you see at the top here, these little bell shapes, those are kernels. And what they're doing is they're reweighting the data so that the regression at that site only sees the data inside of that bell. And where the bell is higher, the data is given more consideration. And where the bell is lower, the data is given less consideration. If you've ever heard of, say, low S or kernel regression in um, like Cleveland and Devlin kind of things, geographically weighted regression is an extension of this into geography. So when you work with um, geographically weighted regression, you get distinct estimates of the slope at each site. And that's constructed using this weighting matrix, which upweights places that are close to your site and disregards sites that are really far away. If you want to advance, Pedro, that would be great. Ah, even more symbols, great. Um, I'm sorry that the, uh, the symbols didn't come out. I'm not sure why they would have, probably a font issue. Yeah, my fault, sorry, I had that it's fixed. Okay. But I don't know it's why fine, it's okay, don't worry about it. So in multi-scale geographically weighted regression, the estimate of scale can be different depending on the variable you're interested in. In classical geographically weighted regression, we consider uh, observations that are within a given distance at every site. And we do that for all the sites in the same way. And we also allow for all the betas to have the same slope. But using realizations from generalized additive models, we can actually allow for each covariate to have its own spatial scale. So, Maybe one of your effects you don't expect to change at all over geography, but another effect you might expect to change abruptly. With multi-scale GWR, you can do this. Next slide. Oh. Okay, I got the fixed presentation, Levi. Wonderful, just, thank you. I'm so sorry that the... Just because you were, I think, in the final slide, so I'm... Yeah. <laughs> there you there we are. Uh, Oops, sorry, yeah. Okay, so cool. The next, and then one more, I think. Yeah. Wonderful. So how this operates is that we treat each sort of local variable times its local estimate as a smoother function in a generalized additive model. Together, this allows us to estimate individual localities and give unique smooths to each variable. It's just a generalized additive model where the smoothing occurs in geographical space rather than in attribute space. And geographically weighted regression then can have a smooth for every single variable and calibrate that bandwidth, that distance where we consider observations differently for different bandwidths. How this ends up looking, if uh, next slide, Oh, ah, yes, and of course, the improvements that come from the geographically uh, or from the generalized additive model literature are sort of rapidly being incorporated into the current frameworks here. So geographically weighted regression has been around for quite a long time. It was developed in the early to mid 90s. 
Uh, but these connections to generalized additive model literature have really only been coming about in the last year and a half, thanks to some improvements made by my colleague Zichi Li and Han Chen Yu. Uh, Zichi's at uh, University of Illinois, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a great uh, person if there are any uh, job opportunities for people in this cycle. Um, and then my colleague Han Chen Yu, who's at uh, uh, Peking University and is also a postdoc at Arizona State. How this looks in practice is something like this. So this is a model in a forthcoming Annals article uh, with Stuart and Zichi on uh, basically the, the determinants for why people voted uh, in, uh, for Trump in the 2016 election. Um, and what we find is that some socioeconomic and demographic factors are pretty stable geographically. So in a regime's regression, maybe you'd find that this effect is just not at all changing. It's always significant and it takes the same value everywhere. No matter kind of what you get from the estimator, you get this value. Now, it just so happens that the GWR estimate is actually negative and the OLS estimate is actually positive. And this is because of the locality of the smooths. The second thing that can happen is you can have an estimate that's kind of local and not very strong. So in this case, this shows the effect of turnout on the share of vote for Republicans, or no, sorry, share a vote for Democrats. And so places that are blue are places where increases in turnout were associated with increases in Democrat voting. And places in red are places where increases in turnout were associated with Republican voting. And this kind of makes sense that turnout as a variable is going to have partisan differentials depending on where you are. If people are really motivated to, mo to vote for Democrats, then every additional voter that you bring to the polls might break more to one party than another. With geographically weighted regression, you can allow this to happen. You can capture the fact that turnout as an effect can vary geographically. And finally, possibly the most important factor in geographically weighted regression in the next slide, is that you can interpret the intercept in a really fundamental way. The intercept of a geographically weighted regression will generally be the sort of last smooth, and you can sort of have these global effects that apply everywhere, and you can kind of have these local effects that don't necessarily apply. But then the intercept is interpreted as the baseline response. As everybody sort of classically knows from a standard linear model, this is kind of like the intrinsic direction of a particular place based on its context. So here we can see that despite all these other control variables that we've introduced into our geographic weighted regression, we get back a partisan geography that's very, very understandable. Weakly aligned states like Florida, Ohio, Colorado come out as split or weakly aligned in the intercept. Strong Republican states come out as having you know, a deep red belt and a strong blue wall in the north, despite the fact that the socioeconomic conditions did not mean that all of these states went blue or went red. So geographically weighted regression then allows us to kind of estimate the intrinsic effect of local context through the intercept variable, as well as allowing for effects that apply everywhere, that only apply in some places, or that have strong local trends. And that's where geographic, geographically weighted regression's comparative advantage is. So that's, I think, all I had to say about GWR. It should be, next slide. Yeah, cool. And then we'll let, we'll let Pedro resume on cluster regression. Thank you so much, Levi. So Levi, I forgot to mention that he is the main maintainer of the code of MGWR in PySAL. So that's why it was great for us to hear it from the source. Uh, how it works. So, I mean, so far we've spoken about some, sometimes you may have already like a different, you know that you have different re, uh, regions in your data, like North and South in Columbus, Ohio, or it may be the case that you want to estimate different parameters or different coefficients for each of the areas in your data as Levi was presenting. Okay, so these are two situations uh, that may be of interest to you. However, some other times you may want a less uh, flexible structure in your data. So you want to have a limited 
a number of coefficients or less coefficients for you to analyze. You just want to have a, a more, you know, a small set of coefficients to look at. But you, you want uh, the regions, like the different coefficients, you don't really know to which regions they pertain to. So you don't really know how your data is structured in regions. So this is where cluster regressions uh, will come to your help. So the idea is that, I mean, if we talk, think about clustering uh, in a non-spatial uh, sense or in a classic sense, what we have is that when we think about clusters, we have that groups are created based on homogeneity in, this, in the variable space, right? So you will have regions that are more homogeneous. The unities in these regions are more homogeneous than the unities outside it, or the groups will be as heterogeneous uh, as possible. So there are many different uh, uh, methods for us to, to define or to classify unities into clusters and then have the, the regions being uh, defined endogenously. If we think about spatial clustering, what we do is to add an additional restriction to clustering. So we, we think, uh, when, when we think about spatial clustering, we're roughly just saying that, okay, I want to classify these spatial units, but I only want unities that are contiguous or that are neighbors to each other being part of the same group. So it's not enough for them to be uh, similar in the space of the variables, but you may also want them to be similar geographically. So you may also want them to be uh, close to each other in a constrained uh, geographical sense. So this is where uh, spatial clustering methods will come to your support. So when we think about regression or spatial regression uh, based on clusters, this is what we're going to, to think about. So we want the spatial units to be organized or classified endogenously. So the data is gonna tell uh, which Unities are part of each group, but we want these units to be uh, neighbors of each other geographically. So in space, in, con in concrete space, not only in the abstract space of the variables. So this is the idea of what we can do, uh, or you will be able to do in the next release of SPREG or the next PySouth release. So just an example here, uh, think about King County house, uh, house prices. Uh, this was a Kaggle data set, so it's interesting because it's being dealt with uh, like from many different perspectives. And uh, as you can see, we have close to Seattle, uh, you have uh, uh, some areas that have uh, higher price levels. Okay, but I mean, we're thinking about housing markets, right? So we know that uh, just an additional square feet of area it, it doesn't have the same value uh, across all the regions in space, right? I mean, the coefficients will change if you model these. So an additional square feet of area will have a different impact on the total uh, value of a house according to the location where we are, where you are. So it's important to try to design sub-markets within uh, this kind of data. So this is where uh, cluster regression will help you. For example, here we have six different sub-markets that were defined based on the data itself and then we had a regression on top of it to actually be able to identify the different parameters that we have in the model. So here, just so you can see uh, how the regression fit improves by assigning the spatial units or the houses to sub-markets that are defined again endogenously. I mean, if you start with only two groups, you have uh, a total sum of squared residuals that may be up to uh, 1500. But if you go, uh, let's say to 10 different groups, I mean, you already get uh, that decreased by 33% or something like that. Okay, so I mean, it is really important for you to be, to, for the fit of the model to be able sometimes to classify these units into endogenous regions. And these regions may uh, show some, uh, or may be able to, have, to represent the heterogeneity that you have in your data. So how do you run that in PISA? How, uh, or, or how will you be able to run that in SPREG? Oh, by the way, I'm mentioning the next release and, and it's really short, it's next month, right? So there is a release, uh, a release stage for January and hopefully we'll be able to pack everything uh, by then, but I, I'm very confident that we will. So here, for example, uh, these sub-markets are being defined by price, uh, by uh, the square footage uh, and the year build uh, of the house. And then, I mean, after you are able to, to select the, or to classify the units within or across these sub-markets, you can just run a, a scalar reg command uh, 
within uh, SPREG, and it will uh, first choose the groups uh, for the for each of the, the sorry the groups for each of the observations will be classified the unit is in, in these sub markets and then you can just run a regimes again a regime regression as i've shown you before uh, to actually get the results for each of these regressions right so here i'm just showing you regime zero because i wanted you to be able to see anything in the green but i mean below here you would have regime one two three uh, and four i can show you a summary of the results uh, here so as you can see, I mean, you have six, uh, in this example, we have six different submarkets. And again, as a regime's regression suit in SPREG or in PySAL, you are able to check or to test the stability of the coefficients across these submarkets. So here, for example, you know that the coefficients for the number of bedrooms doesn't change much. So an additional bedroom doesn't affect the price that much uh, across the submarkets. So the coefficient is similar uh, for all the submarkets. However, if you think about bathrooms, then it's different. Bathrooms are important. So, I mean, they differ uh, in space. The effect of an additional bathroom in a house, uh, the effect of it on the total price will differ across the space. And of course, the same applies to area. As I said, it's the most important variable, but to most of the other variables as well, space matters. So there is heterogeneity and it needs to be taken into account. Okay, so just to conclude, some final remarks. Uh, as I've said, PySAL offers many tools for spatial regression and regimes and uh, analysis in Python, as well as spatial analysis, like uh, it has a comprehensive set of tools for spatial analysis. Uh, whatever you think about uh, PySAL may have it. Uh, most of the routines that we have in PySAL, they are easily scalable to hundreds of thousands of observations. Some are to millions of observations, some are not. I mean, it all depends on the operations that um, must be done with the spatial weights. Usually, this is the constraint that we have uh, for computation uh, scalability. So, but anyway, uh, depending on the method, you are able to do a lot in few seconds, if that. And so, given that space is heterogene heterogeneous and endogenous de endogenously determined, uh, restricting coefficients may be a, a very strong assumption. And at least you should, whenever you're thinking about an econometric model or modeling data that you do know the space, the spatial tag of it, you may, you should at least test for structural stability across space. I mean, it's, it's very easy for you to do that using the tools that PySAL uh, provides you. So there's no reason for you not to do that. And in case you realize, as I think most of the, the cases uh, actually fall, I mean, if you realize that there is no structural stability across space, Again, PySAL will offer you many tools to handle these, uh, this heterogeneity and you'll be able to, to do it. But if you need something that you cannot find in, in PySAL or you cannot find in SPREG, uh, specifically in SPREG or in PySAL, I mean, PySAL, as I said, is open source and, and it's based in spewed uh, from the community. So just come and join us and, and bring uh, whatever you need, what is uh, the demand that you have and help us to add the answer to that or the tool that is able to fix or to work on the specific data that you have, you can help us to construct and to build this up uh, and add more and more methods to PySAL as we've been seeing at every release uh, that we have. Okay, thank you so much again, uh, Levi. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all, uh, you all that have shown up for, for this talk. I'm really glad that I was able to give it. And if you want to get in touch with Levi or myself, I mean, you can find our Twitter uh, handles there, or you can just shoot me an email, or you can just join our Gitter chat uh, in PySAL, or I mean, send us some smoke signals, we'll be able to see them. It's very easy to, to reach us and to find us. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks. So we have a couple of questions um, already in the chat. Uh, so Augusto Oliveira is asking about um, out of sample prediction. So um, has the SPREG library sort of a process for doing out of sample predictions? Um, and is there kind of like examples that uh, might illustrate that? Uh, I don't think we have anything like that in PySol as a whole. Do you know anything, Levi? I mean, aside from explicitly constructing the uh, out of sample predictions, no, I don't think so. Um, so any of the any of the methods in SPREG will generate 
uh, parameter estimates, which you can then use to predict out of sample. Uh, in some cases, that will be much more challenging than others because, for instance, in a spatial lag regression, you're going to have to change the entire uh, structure. So out of sample prediction for some model specifications will be challenging. Uh, but for GWR, yeah. it's not. Um, and for many of the models in, in SPREG, it won't be either. I mean, of course, you can. we don't only provide, as it's a Python-based library, so we don't only provide the results. We provide all the elements of that, those results as objects. So you do have a, a set of coefficients that you can use and apply to whatever sample that you have or whatever data that you have that is not part of the modeling sample. But we don't offer any methods that will actually show you like how, how does it fit or anything like that. You'll be on your own. Basically, that's, I think, what uh, is the answer to this question. So we don't have any method that is any functionality that is suited for that. We provide you with all the information that you will need from the sample estimations. And then you can just use uh, it from, from that. I think that's, yeah, that's it. Sorry, Augusto. <laughs> um, Hector Theolakis uh, says, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, could MGWR be used as part of a multi-level model? And also, is there functionality in PySAL to support multi-level modeling applications? Thanks in advance. Um, so I'll take this as the, the MGWR speaker. Um, so in theory, it's possible. Um, in practice, geographically weighted regressions kind of statistical view of the world is that there are no hard boundaries. So fitting a geographically weighted regression inside of a multi-level model that say allows for variances or slopes to change over geography um, is mathematically possible, but sort of conceptually inconsistent. And uh, so my suggestion would be kind of pick one or the other. And normally, if you're working with multi-level models, you can get down to a pretty resolute scale anyway. So um, usually, if you are interested in that structure, you'll have the amount of information uh, that you'll need. Um, there are also methods in the uh, spatially correlated variance components models package <laughs> titled SPVCM uh, that do allow for spatially correlated variance components models, uh, which are a kind of multi-level model. Um, however, this is a rapidly advancing frontier of research with uh, a lot of kind of confusing and contradictory results about the methodology and appropriate representations of these models. So um, that is a little bit more cutting edge. And I would suggest that anybody who's interested in those kinds of models should probably take a hard look at the literature uh, before diving headfirst into spatially correlated multi-level models. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Pedro, but... Uh, no, I think, yep, yeah, that's it. And cool, and then, great. Um, can keep going through the questions. Could you summarize what kinds of questions can be answered by spatial regression better than other classical statistical analysis? I'll let you go on that one. Well, I think here we can even drop the spatial in the sense and think about regression and, and like statistical analysis as a whole, because space will, you'll be able to bring in space whether you're thinking about regression or not. Uh, so if you think about what regression has to offer you, I mean, regression is nothing but a multivariate analysis, right? You have a, a bunch of variables. One you think is determined by the others, or you may even have some simultaneity going on. But anyway, uh, usually you have one variable that you think is determined by the others, and you want to measure this relationship. So this is the idea uh, that uh, spatial, what spatial regression brings us brings to the table for us. Uh, what we get by using spatial regression is that we are able to evaluate a given variable, again, our dependent variable, and a set of independent variables and measure specifically what is the marginal effect of each of the variables that we have on these dependent uh, variables that we've selected. So the idea of using uh, a regression framework is to be able to measure the net effect of each of the explanatory variables that you have. So you have the full picture, you have a, a, a conjointly uh, effect, so you measure how everything is changing or, or the, the full dynamics of the, the data that you are looking at, but you are able to separate and measure individually 
the effect of each of your variables uh, on the effect that they have on the dependent variable. So if we bring that into the spatial framework, again, if you do just classic uh, regression, you have some strong hypotheses if you think about real world data. So if you're doing classic econometrics, usually you will have to assume that the residuals or that the error term in this data is not correlated in the sense that, I mean, the space most likely doesn't matter. I mean, the first law of geography will say, will tell you if you believe in that, will tell you that everything is related to everything else, right? But near things are more related than distant things. So if you believe in this, and if I think if you look out of the window, you will, uh, the idea is that the classic spatial, the classic econometric uh, assumptions, they usually do not hold. I mean, it's just, they are just too strong. So spatial econometrics, again, just to try to answer uh, what you've asked, spatial econometrics uh, will be able to help you to answer questions about events, like the relationship between variables or agents or whatever that you're looking at. So events that happen in the real world for which you have a spatial tag for them, and not, uh, I mean, be able to, tag, to, to deal with breaking the assumptions of classic regression theory, okay? So, I, I mean, if you think about, uh, I think you ask it for a specific, you know, what kind of question. So I think, yeah, you, it can be as general as that, but there are many questions. Every relationship, every interaction that you think about, or uh, either whether that be uh, economic or sociological or whatever, I mean, since these things happen in space, and if you believe that near things are more related than distant things, these things are not going to be random. And if they're not random, uh, spatial regression will help you to be able to measure specifically the effect of each of the variables, the marginal effect of each one uh, into, in the dependent variable of your interest. I hope I was able to answer. If not, just, just, just uh, maybe type, please try again, and I'll, I'll <laughs> keep trying. One thing I would, uh, I would definitely suggest to add there is that um, there's, a, there's a lot going on at the frontier of kind of AI and machine learning right now about algorithmic bias and concerns about sort of, you know, what it means for a model to mispredict. And what I think that um, is interesting about spatial econometric models is that they really kind of drive at that point. If your errors are correlated and they're correlated geographically, then that likely means that some places are getting systematically mispredicted. So when you look at a map and you see that, oh, you know, our model's really off in this area, all of our predictions are way too high. That's a form of algorithmic bias and it's a placial form of bias. And so when you think about sort of why use spatial regression and there's all these kinds of different statistical justifications and when someone says, you know, our, our residuals will be correlated and that means that you have to address that. Um, you can keep that example in mind as well, is that when, it, when we're saying that your residuals are spatially correlated, we're implying that at some level, they're probably clustering and that individual places are probably gonna be systematically mispredicted. So that's, I think, an important point there that, that spatial techniques will, will um, sort of elucidate. Super. I think you have a question for yourself there, Levi, from Daniel. Up at the top. Yeah. Um, so Dan Milner asks, thanks for the interesting presentation. Just wondering if there are any existing or emerging methods for incorporating categorical variables into multi-scale GWR models. Uh, yeah, there's a PhD student at Arizona State who's uh, working on that right now. Um, so that should be addressed in the next year. Uh, she is set to graduate, I think, in a year and a half. So <laughs> if all goes to plan, uh, it'll be there. So um, Valerio asks, my question is, how does PySAL integrate in terms of data structures and API with other packages in the Python PyData ecosystem? Okay, I think, I mean, Levi is one of the main maintainers of PySAL as a whole. So since this is a PySAL question, I could answer it, but I know he will be able to give a, a better answer. Could you please, Levi, sure. yeah. help me? But yeah, it is wonderfully integrated. <laughs> yeah, so um, we sit on top of all of the major kind of geospatial libraries that you use to work with your data. Um, we have interfaces into network analysis tools like NetworkX. Um, we have a, all of our model constructs can be analyzed directly using scikit-learn. Um, 
we don't ourselves follow uh, some of those API conventions. We have our own, just like you know, any package that comes up designs their own interface. Um, but yeah, we, we sit on top of sort of your favorite tried and true methods that you've seen before. Um, and we are continuously improving our integration with other tools. Uh, mainly we try and stand on top of NumPy and SciPy, but we have conversions and integrations with many different kinds of packages. Um, yeah, if I may add, I would just mm -hmm. um, highlight uh, GeoPandas, as you've seen from the examples uh, that I'm using, uh, I'm using GeoPandas to load the data and handle the data. And then I'll just, uh, when I'm calling the function to estimate the models, I just convert that to NumP only then. So everything else is built upon uh, GeoPandas. So, I mean, it's very easy to use uh, standard other packages in PySol to, to run these regressions or anything else in PySol. Indeed. So um, there's actually still quite a few questions. So um, it's uh, very active today, which is wonderful. Um, so we have another question from Cristiano Almeida from Brazil. Um, congratulations for the presentation. I have a question for Pedro. Um, do you think that it's possible to find the spatial structure behind environmental data, for example, like rainfall, using some of the PySAL methods? Yes, I mean, you can you have from PySol, you have many exploratory spatial data analysis that will, where you'll be able, for example, if you're thinking about, as you said, uh, rainfall data. I mean, you will be able to assess the spatial uh, feature of that data, like in many ways. You can do uh, spatial autocorrelation analysis. Uh, I mean, there are many methods I, I'm thinking here. For example, uh, you could see whether this data is actually uh, correlated um, or not in space. And if you are able to test that using different weights matrices, you may even be able to see what spatial structure uh, provides, uh, uh, like how the, the, the different spatial structures will change the results that you have. So they may help you to investigate the actual spatial uh, structure that you have in this data. Uh, bear in mind that uh, you can't really you know, compare some uh, the results, like uh, being specific, if you run, for example, a more runs eye, you can't directly compare the results for the coefficient uh, using different uh, spatial weights matrices if you do not standardize them, because uh, the, the variable space of the more runs eye depends on the spatial weights matrix. But, I mean, it is, it is something you can play with, and if you do it correctly, it may show you some insights. If you want to go deeper, if you want to add more variables and think about it in a regression framework, again, uh, you may be able to get some insights if you uh, uh, try uh, to model different spatial structures. So again, different spatial uh, weight, weights matrices and assess not the dependence there, because again, it would be meaningless, but to assess the fit of the model. And in that sense, if you think about uh, rainfall, maybe you want to see how that relates with uh, temperature or uh, congestion or density or whatever. I mean, I never studied this, so I can't think of many variables, but I think these should be some that relate to rainfall or mountains or topology or whatever. Uh, if you are able to put a structure into this, you can use some weighting scheme and again, assess different weighting schemes and see which one will provide you a better fit for your model. And the model fits may be comparable uh, depending on the way you build your models. So there are many ways for you to be able uh, to do this in, in PySol. So PySol does offer you some tools to, to help you with that. Wonderful. Um, and I, we have a question from Rachel now, uh, if she'd like to go. I hate to break in because we have so many questions in the Q&A and I know our time is just about up, but I had sort of a, a macro level question, maybe even a meta question for both you and Levi, which is that if we look in the literature, you could almost make the argument that we see sort of parallel streams. We see lots of methodological papers on applications and why these applications are important. But then if you look at sort of substantive research areas and say geography or sociology or economics and the methods that are being used, there doesn't always seem to my mind to be a lot of uptake of the more innovative methods. And here I really am talking about more like 
GWR, for example, because I think on the machine learning side, the economists, for example, are going to pick up on that and that's going to happen. So I'm curious what you see as sort of the barriers to uptake, because I assume that when you work in sort of a method space, what you really want is for the, the applied side of the fields to pick up on these options and opportunities. Do you want to go first, Pedro, or um, I'm happy to talk about GWR specifically. Yeah, she did mention GWR specifically, so, but <laughs> I can begin. Uh, yeah, of course, hard question, right, a tough one. I think uh, part of this, uh, Rachel, it may be because sometimes the issues, or let's think about a, a, a classic spatial regression, so uh, lag and error models. If you think about this, uh, like what are you actually gaining by running these regressions? Sometimes they may look like a, an overkill to the issues that you have, right? So for example, if you have an error process or an error model, uh, sorry, uh, what you're gaining from running like maybe a complicated spatial structure is just a more efficient model. I mean, the, the coefficients that you had were already uh, consistent, right? So they, I mean, do you really need to, to run a very, tough model if you have too many observations, something that will take uh, demand a lot of computational power. And I, at least from, from my perspective, at least in economics, because that's the one I can talk about. I'm really sorry I can't talk much about uh, ge geography or, or sociology. But in economics, I think sometimes this is what uh, makes people to, to you know, uh, turn uh, from uh, spatial econometrics because it is, uh, it may be, uh, demanding and there is a, a computationally and, and in, in a learning perspective, but it may not contribute too much if the spatial process that you're facing is not, uh, you know, something that that really may change or result in bias for your model or something like that. Uh, at least this is my view and I'm not sure if you agree or not. I, I really, I, this is something I would like you to answer as well, if possible, after Levi, if you could uh, ask yourself that. Uh, in a mirror looking at the camera, I, I would be very interested in your, answer, in your answer to that as well. I'm happy to let Rachel go. <laughs> I think GWR is actually a very interesting case. I mean, I, I see the argument for sort of the spatial regress, regression perspective, and I think in a sort of an econometrics framework, we're often concerned with, um, we have bigger fish to catch I think in terms of the model structure and what the model needs to be able to do. Thinking like an economist, it's more about the causal identification than anything else. And so if the spatial piece isn't going to push that forward, then, then maybe why invest energy in it? I'm more curious, I am genuinely curious about the GWR and sort of the, we see applications, but I think without actually seeing the data that when we see applications in applied areas, it's applied geography of some sort and it's not necessarily spilling over into other disciplines, especially in the social sciences. And so I'm yeah. really curious why that is. Uh, Two maybe, reasons, I okay. think. Give, so give us, I've, I've thought about this a lot as well um, and had plenty of conversations with my colleague, Taylor um, Oshan at Maryland about this. I think there are two reasons. One of them is that um, in, a, in a kernel regression, like classic Cleveland and Devlin style low S regression where you fit the squiggly line on your point cloud. You're not then trying to interpret the instantaneous rate of change of that line. You're not trying to interpret the beta at a specific X value. And even for most generalized additive modeling, you're not necessarily interested in the exact slope at a given point in the spline. You're interested in the overall shape and the prediction thereof. Geographically weighted regression, on the other hand, come up with these pretty variable coefficient maps. And that's the analog of what we're doing, is we're interpreting the instantaneous rate of change of some smooth function in high dimension. I think there's a lot of skepticism to that. And I think that skepticism is warranted because we don't really know the structure of interactions between that and whether or not the model is linear. You know, if Nonlinearities make spatial patterns occur. They, they, a, a couple of good papers coming out recently that show this, you know, if you have a nonlinear relationship between your X and your Y and you fit a GWR, you can suddenly see a spatial relationship. And it's just an, an effect of the fact that the beta is going to pick up 
the nonlinear relationship. So part of the reason why is that GWR is a GAM that isn't used like all the rest of the GAMs, right? It, it's got this completely bespoke collection of interpretations and things. Um, and the second kind of reason is because that scale parameter that you get out of the GWR is really hard to make intrinsically meaningful. And I think that outside of being a geographer and using it for geographical study, it's not really useful to most people because they have a sort of prior theory about the causal scale of the process. And you know, if they fit a GWR and they find out that it has you know, 68 nearest neighbors or the optimum, that's not gonna give them anything that they you know, can use in any other context. It's, it's, it's like we're putting significance on the kernel bandwidth of a low S regression. So whenever I think about GWR and its kind of interpretational and application challenges, I go straight to that kind of concept. What would this be like if I were just doing this in attribute space? And why is it special or different? You know, you couldn't publish a paper on low S and say, this is my great model. I fit this one regression and now I'm going to interpret it for the rest of the paper. But we do that with GWR. I don't know if there's any more information coming out of that. And we might need to think critically about how the tool is used, even in our own literature, because I think we might be overusing it or using it in an inappropriate manner. Thank you for the question, because it's, it's, it's very good. And I think it affects a lot of the things that we do. I think there are also a lot of statisticians who come up with incredibly niche methods that will never see the light of day either. Um, but yeah, so um, we've gone quite a bit over time at this point. Um, there's been a lot of audience uh, interest and feedback. Um, so all I wanna uh, do at this point, uh, for those of you that are still here, is to mention that next week, um, we have our last talk of the session uh, with David Van Riper from the Minnesota Population Center talking about um, differential privacy and census data. Uh, I'm sure that this will be an excellent talk, even if you're not from the US or oriented towards US data, because it's going to discuss large scale concepts about census data collection and analysis. So it'll be really, I think, engaging and fun. Um, and as we said before, uh, the talk will be posted on our YouTube channel, uh, which I will put in the, um, the chat here. Um, and we'll make sure to have that up as soon as we can. So thank you very much for attending. And I hope everybody has a good morning or good evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much.